Hello and welcome to The World This Week with James Dickman. A look back at some of the biggest global news stories for an international city. Brought to you by the London Live News team. Coming up this morning. Putin is accused of holding the world to ransom over his blockade of the Black Sea, stopping Ukraine from transporting vital food and grain to the rest of the world. As warnings come of a desperate imbalance in global food resources that could be upon us. Warning missiles blasted towards North Korea as the US and South Korea retaliate to Kim Jong-un's own ballistic posturing just hours earlier. And the nerves will be mounting as the day goes on ahead of the Champions League final in Paris tonight as Liverpool will want to set the record straight against Real Madrid after their heartbreak in 2018. It's all on the way before 7.30, but first to the tragedy in Texas, another school shooting that has shocked the world once again. 19 children and two adults were killed, while 17 others were injured when an 18-year-old gunman went on a sickening rampage inside Robb Elementary School in Uvalde on Wednesday. The gunman was able to enter the building unobstructed, according to the police. The children who died were aged 8 to 11 years old. The killer, named Salvador Ramos, was inside the school for up to an hour before he was killed. He had shot his grandmother in the face before stealing the family truck and driving to the school armed with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. The grandmother survived and called the police on him. Well, he dumped the truck outside and made his way in, shooting children and teachers indiscriminately. He then barricaded himself inside a classroom. Officers eventually made their way in before a border control officer shot him dead. Uvalde is an unassuming town, some 80 miles from San Antonio, America's seventh largest city with a largely Latin American population. The incident has, of course, brought the discussion around gun control to the fore once again, as many are still baffled about how much of the right wing of America's absurdly steadfast commitment to doing nothing about those laws, despite another massacre. Joe Biden spoke after the shooting, demanding action. I had hoped when I became president I would not have to do this again. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done? It's been 3,448 days, 10 years since I stood up at a high school in Connecticut, a grade school in Connecticut, where another gunman ma massacred 26 people, including 20 first graders at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Since then, there have been over 900 incidents of gunfires reported on school grounds. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Santa Fe High School in Texas. Oxford High School in Michigan. The list goes on and on, and the list grows when it include mass shootings at places like movie theaters, houses of worship, as we saw just 10 days ago at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. I am sick and tired of it. We have to act. And don't tell me we can't have an impact on this carnage. Well, as things unraveled in the days after, the governor of Texas says the gunman warned on social media minutes before the attack that he was going to shoot up a school. As of this time, the only information that was known in advance was posted by the gunman on Facebook approximately 30 minutes before reaching the school. The first post was to the point of, he said, I'm going to shoot my grandmother. The second post was, I shot my grandmother. 
the third post, maybe less than 15 minutes before arriving at the school, was, I'm going to shoot an elementary school. Well, in the same news conference on Wednesday, where Texas Governor Greg Abbott was giving that update, Democrat Beto O'Rourke confronted him on the issue of the laws and its handling in the Republican-run state. I will uh, pass the mic to Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. So sit down. You're out of you're out of line and an embarrassment. Hey. So sit down and don't play this stuff. Shooting is right now, and you are doing nothing. No. You need to get this out of here. This is the place to talk to us over. This is totally predictable when you. Sir, you're out of line. Sir, you are out of line. Sir, you are out of line. Please leave this auditorium. I can't believe you're a sick son of a that would come to a deal like this to make a political issue. O'Rourke is running against Abbott for governor this year. He spoke outside the auditorium after his confrontation as well. And those folks on that stage want to distract us with, with every manner of, of politics or theater or, um, you know, mental health or video games or there's not enough prayer in school. These are all things I've heard those people on that stage talk about and attribute these kinds of, of acts of terror to. Um, we just got to acknowledge that they actually have the power to change our laws, to improve them, where you can protect the Second Amendment and do a far better job of protecting the lives of the people in our community. The question all of you need to ask him is why does he want violent criminals to be able to carry guns on our streets? Go, go ask him that. He, he has not had to answer for any of this, and he gets by with this theater. I'm calling it out. I came here to call it out to stop this, because if we don't stop it, it will continue to happen. A story of those affected. Suraya, a fifth grade teacher at a local middle school, learned with her in-laws and husband that her niece, Eliana Garcia, had died. The family waited at the Civic Center for cotton swabs to confirm the death. Um, she was very happy and very outgoing. Loved to dance and sing and play sports. She was taken to family, enjoyed being with the family. She sounded like a good girl. She was. <laughs> She was very sweet. I just don't understand how people could sell that type of a gun to a kid, to an 18 year old. Like, what is he going to use it for? But for that purpose. Heartbreaking fallout from the avoidable carnage in Uvalde, where tributes continue to pour in from around the globe. Next, to the ongoing war in Ukraine, as Russia continues to attack areas in eastern Ukraine to strengthen its grip nearest its own border. The Donbass could be left uninhabited by the Russian invasion, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky claimed yesterday. On Thursday, Ukraine said Vladimir Putin's forces have attacked more than 40 towns in the eastern Donetsk and Luhansk region. Other cities in the Donbass region are being continually bombarded. Well, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz said that Russia cannot win the war, but President Putin will not seriously negotiate until he realizes that. Zelensky on Wednesday strongly rebuffed those in the West who have suggested Ukraine cede control of areas occupied by Russian forces for the sake of reaching a peace agreement. No matter what Russia is doing, there are some who say let's consider its interests. It was heard again this year in Davos, despite thousands of Russian missiles that have hit Ukraine, despite tens of thousands of Ukrainians killed, despite Butcher, Maripol, despite destroyed cities and despite filtration camps built by the Russian state, where they kill, torment, rape and humiliate, like on a conveyor belt. 
Yep. In Davos, for example, Mr. Kissinger has emerged from the deep past and said that part of Ukraine should be given to Russia to avoid the alienation of Russia from Europe. It seems that Mr. Kissinger has 1938 on the calendar instead of 2022, and he thought that he was addressing the audience in Munich of those times instead of the audience in Davos. And behind all these geopolitical speculations of those who advise Ukraine to give something away to Russia, great geopoliticians are always unwilling to see ordinary people. Ordinary Ukrainians, millions of those who are living in the territory they propose exchanging for an illusion of peace. We always must think of the people and remember that values are not just words. Ukrainian armed forces, our intelligence and those who defend the state are resisting extremely fierce offence of Russian troops in the east. In some areas the enemy is significantly outnumbering us with equipment and soldiers. Russian authorities have made a demonstrative decision. They have allowed the hiring of older people for contract service, so they no longer have enough young people, but the desire to fight still remains. It still takes time to repel this desire. We still need the help of partners, especially weapons for Ukraine, full support without exceptions and restrictions, enough to win. That's what those who really value people are talking about. Also at the start of the week, a Ukrainian court sentenced a 21-year-old Russian soldier to life in prison on Monday for killing a civilian, sealing the first conviction for war crimes since Moscow's invasion in February. Vadim Shishimarin pleaded guilty to shooting a 62-year-old man in the head in a village in northeastern Sumy region in the early days of the war. He testified that he shot Alexander Shelipov after being ordered to do so. Well, the consequences of this conflict are obviously far-reaching, and Ukraine's harvest is one trapped by war. The World Food Programme has warned of a catastrophic failure in food supply chains, which could lead to starvation and global instability. Ukrainian farmers have 25 million tonnes of grain. They cannot get to international markets, and a new harvest is about to begin. The grain cannot be exported due to Russia's blockade of its Black Sea ports, as well as powerful images have surfaced of grain burning in a silo on Wednesday in a combat zone in East Ukraine. The silo in Siveresk in the Donetsk region was destroyed by Russian shelling. It comes the same week as the head of the World Bank has warned that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could cause a global recession as the price of food, energy and fertiliser all jump. The World This Week continues after the break. The US and South Korea fire retaliation rockets to prove they're ready for anything after North Korea tested missiles this week. Welcome back. You're watching The World This Week from the London Live News team. Still to come before 7.30. Crucial survey of one of Britain's most beloved seabirds. It can be tricky work counting puffins, but vital to understand the effect climate change may be having on their population. Stay with us. But first, to the big story from the UK this week. The release of the Sue Gray report into parties held at Downing Street was released on Wednesday. It found that the senior leadership in Boris Johnson's government must bear responsibility for the culture which led to coronavirus lockdown rules being broken, the very same rules that Number 10 set out. The PM refused to go nonetheless, despite many declaring that Boris Johnson indeed did mislead Parliament when he said he had no knowledge of events when the report and recent testimony shows he in fact presided over much of what went on. Well, the report gave details of gatherings at which officials drank so much they were sick, sang karaoke, became involved in altercations and abused security and cleaning staff at a time when millions of people across the country were unable to see friends and family. The Metropolitan Police issued 126 fines for rule breaches in Number 10 and Whitehall, with the Prime Minister receiving a single fixed penalty notice for his birthday party. Well, Boris Johnson has offered his apologies and said his team were humbled by the findings. 
Labour leaders Keir Starmer joined the majority of opposition MPs and some from within the Conservative Party on calling the PM to resign and said this report showed that the government had treated the sacrifices of the British people with utter contempt. Well, our news programme on Wednesday uh, gave a full look back at key moments from Commons on that day, available on our website. But this programme heard from the grief-stricken daughter of a Covid victim. Sophia, who was 29, recalled how lockdown restrictions in place last February meant she was denied a final goodbye with her father before he died. She spoke at the Covid memorial wall in Westminster. Raucous and savage behaviour from the people that were leading us and supposed to be protecting us. To put it into perspective, um, my family, our days hung around the calls. Sorry. Our days hung around the calls that we would get from the hospital. Um, my dad could barely breathe and speak to us. Um, on the day that he died, we got a call from the hospital and were given two options of whether they would turn the machine off in front of us and he would die with us there or they would turn it off um, or they would let him kind of progress that afternoon and he would die that afternoon alone. Um, and whilst we were experiencing that, the government was celebrating, drinking cheese and wine, organising parties together, making jokes about it, being rude to their security staff and their cleaners. It's disgusting. It makes me, it makes me embarrassed to be British. And I think, you know, this pandemic is a global pandemic. We have one of the worst death rates in the world. When are we going to take accountability? And I think it shows the lack of moral authority that this government has. Um, and I don't know how this country can continue to have any faith in them whatsoever, certainly after this report has come out. And I think that we need to bear in mind that Boris Johnson's main priority is Boris Johnson and not the public. Um, and he will do everything that he can to minimise that drama. Right, some other headlines from around the world in brief now as we head first to West Africa. Eleven newborn babies died in a hospital fire in Tivuane in western Senegal. The incident was reportedly caused by a short circuit and the fire spread very quickly according to reports. The city's mayor, Demba Diop, said three babies were saved and according to local media, the hospital was officially opened later this week. Thousands of leaked photographs from Xinjiang in northwestern China have reportedly provided fresh evidence of involuntary mass incarceration of Uyghurs in the region. Data hacked from police computer servers in the area contained over 5,000 police photographs of the minority community taken between January and July in 2018. Human rights groups have been for years accusing China of systematically oppressing Uyghurs who are an ethnic Muslim minority. Concerns have been raised about widespread abuses, including the mass incarceration, forced labor, torture, and sexual assault of more than one million Uyghurs in detention centers in China. South Korea and US fired a ballistic missile and an army tactical missile system missile into the East Sea on Wednesday. The South Korean military explained their response was aimed at highlighting theirs and the US military's rapid response capabilities. Well, earlier North Korea test launched a suspected intercontinental ballistic missile and two shorter range weapons towards its eastern waters. It came just a day after US President Joe Biden left the region following a trip that saw him vowing to bolster measures to deter North Korea. And in the big footballing action this weekend, Liverpool will take on Real Madrid in the Champions League final this evening at the Stade de France in Paris. Jurgen Klopp's men have had to lick their wounds as fast as possible after Manchester City pit them to Premier League glory on Sunday, defeating Liverpool's quadruple hopes, having already won two domestic cups. Four years ago, Real Madrid beat Liverpool in the Champions League final after Mo Salah was injured by Sergio Ramos, the centre-back, in the opening minutes. The world-class Egyptian said he was out to put things right this time round, but Klopp this week played down any notion of revenge. I don't believe in revenge. I don't think you, but I understand it as well. So it's not just, I don't believe, I don't think if you ever heard that, sorry, that revenge is a fantastic idea. So, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, but we also, I understand it, but I'm not sure it's the right thing to do. And for us, it's, I understand um, that more, what more said, that he said, I want to put it right, that's, I want to put it right. 
in Germany we say you always meet twice in life. So, and it, that sounds more as a threat than it actually is. It's just like behave better in the first moment because if you meet again, yeah, you will get the reception. And don't say, um, uh, or the reaction. So um, it's all fine between me and us and Real Madrid. It's a, a football game on the highest level. Um, and if, um, if the, yeah, whoever thinks it's a good idea to, to give us the opportunity to win it this time, I think it would be a great story. Um, but it will not happen because what happened in 2018 just will happen if we make the right decisions on a pitch, and I hope we can do that. Liverpool gunning for the treble this evening if crowned champions of Europe. Madrid looking for the double after winning the La Liga in Spain. Right, finally, a crucial survey by the National Trust of one of Britain's most beloved seabirds is being carried out to see if its numbers are being affected by climate change. Annual surveys of the puffin population on the Farne Islands started five years ago, but they were suspended during the pandemic. So this year's figures will be vital for understanding how the seabirds are doing. National Trust rangers have had to get their fingers pretty dirty as well to carry out the vital work. When we're looking at the burrows, we're looking at fresh droppings, fresh digging, if there are any sand eels near the entrance, um, feathers, if the burrow is well lined, and if we can see any eggshells or kind of see a puffling at the end of the burrow, it's a good sign it's occupied. If we can't tell from the outside, then we can very gently place our hands inside the burrow. When we do this, we are at risk of getting a bit of a nip or we might get the puffin toilet, but if we're lucky, we'll get an egg or a buffling. Well, recent heavy storms flooded burrows and washed away soil and wider climate change could have affected sand eels, which are their primary source of food, leading to fears about their overall numbers. Well, numbers have fallen by 15% in recent years, so the current survey will give experts a clearer picture of the state of the population. Puffins can live to be 35 years old, returning to breed each year after spending their winter out at sea, arriving back on the islands in late March or early April. There you go. That's all from The World This Week with James Dickman. We'll see you at 7 next Saturday as we round up the biggest international stories for a global city. But for now, take care and good morning.